Hello, I'm Eric Huang. You're listening to Saint Podcast, a podcast about the always fascinating and often controversial lives of the saints. This is a history and culture podcast that traces the origins of morality tales of the saints or hagiographies through queer and feminist stories, ancient legends and lore, art history, and pop culture. In celebration of the holiday season is this special Saint Podcast episode. It's a two-part exploration of how Saint Nicholas evolved into Santa Claus. The story isn't a straightforward one at all, and involves a truly motley crew of gift givers, demons, humanoid helpers, witches, goddesses and gods, and animal sidekicks. The story begins with the first humans, and proceeds through the rise and fall of great civilizations, the birth of Christianity, the Reformation, the age of European exploration and colonialism, and the advent of modern publishing and advertising. This is part one of Last Christmas, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, and Christmas Past. The story of Santa Claus is a circuitous one that encompasses a coterie of divine and demonic figures. Let's begin with a saint, the bishop Saint Nicholas. The earliest mention of Nicholas is a vita or life of Saint Nicholas written around the time of his death in the 4th century. The work itself hasn't survived though. We only know of it from later pieces that reference its existence. One of these is a written account 200 years after the saint's death, with vague mentions of a man named Nicholas of Myra. None of Nicholas's own writings have been found, nor are there any mentions of him from the surviving works of contemporaneous writers and theologians. The earliest surviving hagiography and the source for most of our knowledge comes from the 9th century. It's written by Michael the Archimandrite. Archimandrite is a title bestowed on a senior monk from the Eastern Church. About a century later, the renowned hagiographer Simeon the Metaphrast combined stories about another Nicholas, Nicholas of Penara, with those of Nicholas of Myra. Simeon's compilation, Menologian, presents a new Nicholas, with new details of the man, now called a bishop, with tales of his parentage, birth, childhood, and miracles. Because of Simeon the Metaphrast, the Saint Nicholas we know today isn't one man, but two. He's an amalgam of the possibly historic Nicholas of Myra and Nicholas of Penara. As such, this Chimera Nicholas was among the numerous saints removed from the Holy Roman calendar in 1969, which demoted his feast day to an optional day of observance. This all said, the worship of Saint Nicholas in the Eastern Church is still very strong. And the saint is world famous, more famous now than ever. Historic or not, Nicholas is born on the 15th of March in the year 270. His birthplace is a Roman port town on the Mediterranean called Patara, that is today on the southwestern coast of Turkey. His family is of Greek origin and very wealthy. Sources give his parents one of two pairs of names, either Epiphanius and Johanna, or Theophanes and Nona. According to the golden legend from the 13th century, Epiphanius and Johanna only had conjugal relations once, to conceive Nicholas, after which they remained celibate till death. Nicholas is an unusual child. Here is a passage from the golden legend to illustrate this. While the infant was being bathed on the first day of his life, he stood straight up in the bath. From then on, he took the breast only once on Wednesdays and Fridays. As a youth, he avoided the dissolute pleasures of his peers, preferring to spend time in churches. And whatever he could understand of the Holy Scriptures, he committed to memory. Anecdotes of superhuman goodness and purity like this one are typical of the hagiography genre. Another hagiography credits an uncle who recognizes holiness in a young Nicholas and enters his preteen nephew into the priesthood in his hometown of Myra. 
Soon afterwards, Nicholas's parents die. Michael the Archimandrite's hagiography tells us Nicholas gives away his family fortune, in particular to the three daughters of a once devout man who has recently lost his fortune due to the, quote, plotting and envy of Satan. Destitute, this man can't afford dowries for his daughters, meaning no one will marry and take care of them. Desperate, the father of three comes up with an unorthodox money-making scheme. He'll prostitute his daughters so they have money to survive. Nicholas hears of this tragedy and decides to help the sisters by surreptitiously throwing a purse of gold into their bedroom at night. Upon discovering the money in the morning, the father expresses his eternal gratitude to the mystery savior and uses all the money to arrange a suitable marriage for his eldest daughter. The night after the wedding, Nicholas throws a second bag of gold through the bedroom window. In the morning, the father secures a proposal of marriage for his second daughter. Here is a passage from the Golden Legend that describes what happens when Nicholas throws the third bag of money through the window. Some little time later, Nicholas threw a double sum of gold into the house. The noise awakened the man and he pursued the fleeing figure, calling out, Stop! Stop! Don't hide from me! and ran faster and faster until he saw that it was Nicholas. Falling to the ground, he wanted to kiss his benefactor's feet, but the saint drew away and exacted a promise that the secret would be kept until after his death. All three daughters are now married off to well-born men. Given the last bag of money contains double the wealth, it provides an income to allow the father to live out his life in modest comfort. This anecdote is very popular in art, a subject matter entitled The Charity of St. Nicholas. Head to the St. Podcast website to see examples of artworks. www.saintpodcast.com Saint is spelled out. S-A-I-N-T The Charity of St. Nicholas is relevant to this Christmas-themed St. Podcast episode because Nicholas makes the father keep his identity a secret and delivers the gifts of gold at night while the daughters are asleep. After giving away his family fortune, Nicholas has many adventures. He travels to the Holy Land, living for a time in Bethlehem, inside a crypt that's believed to be adjacent to the spot where Christ was born. Nicholas's living quarters are commemorated today by a small church, which is said to stand on the very spot where he slept. Saint Nicholas is the patron saint of sailors, fishermen, and travelers, particularly in Greece, where he's become a Christianized Poseidon, called by the faithful Lord of the Sea. There are several maritime stories involving sailors who invoke his aid during storms. Nicholas himself was once nearly shipwrecked and lost at sea, but saved himself and the crew through prayer. An unusual legend related to sea travel involves the pre-Christian divinity Diana, Roman goddess of wild animals and the hunt. In Nicholas's time, Christianity coexisted with ancient religions that were suppressed by the church. Many of these coalesced around sacred streams and trees. According to legend, Nicholas discovers a tree dedicated to the goddess Diana one day and orders that it be chopped down immediately. Here's the golden legend account of what happens next. This infuriated the ancient enemy, who concocted an unnatural oil that had the property of burning on water or on stone. Then, assuming the form of a nun, he came alongside a ship carrying people on their way to visit the saint and called to them, I wanted so much to come with you to the holy man of God, but I cannot. May I ask you to offer this oil at his church and to paint the walls with it in memory of me. And forthwith, the nun vanished. The ancient enemy referenced in the legend is the Roman divinity Diana. Once again, Nicholas protects seagoing travelers. He miraculously sees through the goddess Diana's disguise and warns her off, which suggests that pre-Christian figures are as real as Christian ones although cast as demons instead of divinities. 
When Nicholas returns to Myra from Palestine, he's appointed bishop, an event foretold by a prophecy. The current bishop of Myra dies suddenly, triggering a local conclave to select a replacement. One of the attending men, an unnamed bishop who is, quote, of great authority upon whose opinion the decision of others would depend, hears a divine voice commanding him to take a post by the monastery doors and wait. The first man to walk through is the one who should become bishop. His name, according to the divine voice, is Nicholas. Nicholas, miraculously guided by God, went early to the church and was the first to enter. The bishop, coming up to him, asked his name, and he, filled with the simplicity of a dove, bowed his head and answered, Nicholas, the servant of your holiness. Then all the bishops led him in and installed him on the episcopal throne. This story establishes that Nicholas becomes Bishop of Myra due to God's will. He's the chosen one. As Nicholas's legend evolves from the 11th century onwards, the saint takes on more supernatural, godlike abilities. According to the Golden Legend, a living Nicholas appears later in life as a vision to Emperor Constantine to save three men from execution. When questioned about his identity, Nicholas exclaims to the emperor, I am Nicholas, bishop of the city of Myra. This is remarkable because Nicholas doesn't mention Christ or God at all. There's no self-deprecating follow-up that he's but a servant of the Lord, and that it's only through God's will that he's able to appear before the emperor. All miracles and miraculous appearances detailed in hagiographies credit God as the source of the miracle. Every saint makes this very clear. Not so much for Nicholas, though. This saint strongly announces his own name as the rescuer and miracle worker. It's while he's Bishop of Myra that Nicholas is arrested for being a Christian. Diocletian is the Roman emperor and presides over a period of Christian persecutions. Nicholas isn't martyred, though. It's said that Emperor Constantine frees him. The dates in this story don't really add up, though, and there's still no solid historical evidence of a bishop of Myra named Nicholas. The anecdote is likely a medieval addition to the saint's legend. Another contested detail of Nicholas's life is his presence at the Council of Nicaea, a historic gathering of church officials called by Constantine the Great, the first Christian Roman emperor. The council's main purpose was to settle an ongoing internal battle between Arian Christians and the mainstream Christian church. We discussed Arianism in the first mystics episode, St. Anthony of Egypt, the mystic in the desert. No surviving records in the 600 years between the council and Simeon's book mentions Nicholas's presence or any bishop known as Nicholas of Myra. The main chroniclers of the historic event don't mention him at all, which is highly irregular, especially for a bishop as influential as Nicholas allegedly was. Later medieval hagiographies that place Nicholas at the council attest to his strong opposition to the heretical Arians. According to one account, written 1,000 years after Nicholas's death, the Bishop of Myra is so enraged by an Arian Christian that he slaps him in the face. Emperor Constantine is duty-bound to demote Nicholas, withdrawing the mitre and pallium, the episcopal hat and vestments. Later versions of this story replace the nameless Arian with Arius himself, the founder of the controversial reform movement, who Nicholas doesn't slap, he punches him. This act of violence sees the defrocked bishop imprisoned. Whilst spending the night chained up, the Virgin Mary and Christ appear to the disgraced Nicholas. They free him from his chains and return his vestments, clearly siding with the bishop and condoning the violence against the heretical Arian. St. Nicholas is credited with numerous miracles many of the same healing and future-gazing anecdotes of other saints. There's also an unusual one. 
It's a later addition to Nicholas's legend and becomes as popular as the charity of St. Nicholas. It's a time of great famine, and a thriving butcher's business begins to fail. The butcher fears for his very survival and lures three boys into his house, where he kills and dismembers them. He places the body parts in barrels, pickling the human remains to sell as ham. Nicholas happens upon the butcher shop and sees through the deceit. He makes the sign of the cross. Suddenly, the chopped up body parts reform and resurrect. Numerous paintings and stained glass windows of the pickled boys were created for churches throughout Europe. They show Nicholas dressed as a bishop before three naked boys standing waist deep in barrels. The largely illiterate population who viewed the artworks every day at church misinterpreted the murder and resurrection inside a butcher shop as a scene in which St. Nicholas blesses three orphaned boys who are so impoverished they can't even afford clothing and are forced to live inside barrels. Due to this misreading, St. Nicholas became the patron saint of children. St. Nicholas was 73 when he died on the 6th of December in the year 343. Upon his death, God sent angels to escort his soul to heaven. He was buried in his hometown of Myra, where a holy oil that smells of roses was said to issue forth. In the centuries after his death, Nicholas's body parts were scattered throughout Christendom as highly prized relics. Recent analysis has shown most of the bones are too young to be those of the 4th century bishop. But one pelvis fragment which has found its way to Lyon, France, is exactly the right age, and could very well be the remains from one of the men named Nicholas, who've merged to become Saint Nicholas. It's only hundreds of years after Nicholas's death, after his plundered relics find themselves thousands of miles from their burial place, and his legend spread even further, that the most intriguing part of this story begins. After Nicholas's death, the bones believed to be his remains were fought over by empires. In the 11th century, it was the bones absconded from his tomb in Myra that brought the eastern St. Nicholas to the west. Both the Italian city-state of Bari and the Empire of Venice claimed possession of the true relics of St. Nicholas. The sudden appearance of the bishop's bones in two important Christian sites in the West, and the popularized story of the so-called liberation of bones from Islamic territories, made St. Nicholas and his legend famous. As stories of this gift-giving patron of children spread with missionaries who preached Christianity to the so-called pagans, Local and indigenous populations linked the new Christian figure of St. Nicholas with ancient divinities who were also gift givers. Another similarity between Nicholas and local gods is that his feast day on the 6th of December coincided with existing midwinter celebrations, the period when these local divinities entered homes at night with gifts. Our ancient ancestors observed midwinter rituals before and after the winter solstice, the shortest day and longest night of the year. The traditions were acts of gratitude to the gods for the harvest just past, and also humility to plead for the return of the sun and spring. In the Northern Hemisphere, the winter months of December and January are the darkest months of the year. In the Southern Hemisphere, it's June and July. Close to the poles, the sun barely rises at all. Back then, midwinter was a perilous time. Nothing grew. Livestock that couldn't be fed was slaughtered. The meat preserved along with crops harvested a month or two earlier to hopefully last through the winter. Even more troubling, especially in the northernmost latitudes, were malevolent forces believed to roam the earth, particularly on the winter solstice itself, who took advantage of the lengthy nights to wreak havoc in the mortal realm. One such terror is Yola Kotorin, 
the Icelandic Yule Cat, described as a monstrous black cat who stalks the midwinter landscape searching for human prey, the naughty children who haven't done their chores. Grilla is a troll also from Iceland. She's the mother of the mischievous, gift-giving Yule Lads and kidnaps naughty children. Midwinter rituals involving candle and firelight, talismans made of evergreen branches, prayers and sacrificial feasting kept these forces of darkness at bay whilst providing welcome companionship and merriment. The earliest surviving written evidence of midwinter celebrations comes from ancient Rome. Three festivals were celebrated between December and January. First was Saturnalia on the 17th of December in honor of the god of time and abundance, Saturn. According to Judith Flanders in her book, Christmas, a biography, quote, work ceased, shops closed, gifts of candles were given, and gambling and drinking prevailed. After Saturnalia was the winter solstice, a day dedicated to honoring the sun god Sol Invictus a plea on this darkest day to ensure his return. The third midwinter holiday was Kalends, the New Year celebration. Here are Judith Flanders' words to describe the holiday. Buildings were decorated with greenery, and people ate, drank, and watched races and processions, while small tokens, wreaths, and garlands, or lamps inscribed with happiness in the new year, were exchanged. When Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the year 380, the birth date of Sol Invictus on the 25th of December was Christianized and transformed into the birthday of the human incarnation of the Christian God, Christ. The ancient winter solstice observance became Christmas. As the new faith spread westwards and northwards, Many midwinter traditions were similarly rebranded as Christian holy days. Local customs merged with new Christian rites. Non Christian figures began appearing in reworked biblical stories. Saints combined with goddesses, gods, witches, wizards, as did a host of infernal and demonic figures. In Italy, the Roman goddess of purification and the new year, Strenia, was celebrated by processions and gift-giving on New Year's Day. Her name means gift. Strenai were the presents given on New Year's Day. When Christianity replaced the ancient religion, Strenia evolved into the witch-like Befana, who became a key Christmas figure in the biblical story of the Three Kings. When the Three Kings, or Three Wise Men, followed the Star of Bethlehem in search of the prophesied Son of God, they stopped one night at Befana's house. She was known locally as the best housekeeper, whose dwelling was the only suitable lodging for three traveling kings. Befana welcomed the three men with gracious hospitality, but confessed she didn't know the whereabouts of this newborn messiah they were seeking. In the morning, the three travelers invited Befana to join their pilgrimage. She declined due to housework, but soon regretted her decision. Befana quickly wrapped up a gift and set out to catch up with the three kings and hopefully meet this special child. She never found them. The 5th of January, known as Twelfth Night or Epiphany Eve, is the night before Epiphany, the holy day that commemorates the wise men's arrival at Christ's manger. Befana appears annually on Epiphany Eve, flying on her broom down the chimney of every house in search of the three wise men and Christ. Before departing, she leaves candy in the socks of good children. The naughty ones receive coal. Saint Lucy, whom we met in the Saint Podcast Martyrs episode, Saint Lucy, the pagan spirit of Christmas, also melded with Strenia and Befana. In the north of Italy, it's Saint Lucy, or Santa Lucia, who brings gifts to good children during midwinter. On the night of the 12th of December, the eve of her feast day, children leave plates of carrots and hay for the donkey she rides on. They then hurry to bed. Any children who are still awake when Lucy arrives receive lashes from her riding crop. Good children wake the next morning 
to find carrot and hay replaced with gia ia de ladija, which are sweets shaped like pebbles, literally gravel from the river Adija. There are also heart, horse, and star-shaped shortbread called pasta frola. And lastly, for the naughty children, carbone dolce, sweet coal, a black confectionery that looks a bit like pumice. In Germany and Scandinavia, St. Lucy merged with other local gift-giving gods, like the goddess Freya and a supernatural witch named Lucy, spelled L-U-S-S-I, whose name, like that of the saint, means light. Christian missionaries, hoping to convert the locals, reframed native winter solstice celebrations as the feast day of St. Lucy on the 13th of December. The midwinter traditions met and intertwined. Modern St. Lucy customs are still a blend of Christian and ancient Germanic rites. Another midwinter tradition of Germanic origin is the wild hunt. It occurred nightly during the 12 days of Yule, a harvest celebration in December that heralded change, as darkness gave way to light, and as the old year gave way to the new. The modern usage of the word Yuletide, meaning Christmas season, is derived from this ancient observance. During the supernatural wild hunt, a divine figure, male or female depending on the tradition, led a magical team to hunt mythical beasts and monsters. Mortals who witnessed the hunt suffered curses, death, or banishment to fairy realms. Children made sure to be indoors and fast asleep. In the British Isles, the wild hunt featured in Arthurian legends. In Scandinavia, it was led by Odin, who most people will know from the Marvel movies as the father of Thor. Odin headed the hunting party on an eight-legged flying horse called Sleipnir. And like so many other wild hunt leaders, he visited houses on his flying steed who would eat the carrots and hay prepared by children in socks or shoes. If the household pleased Odin, he'd leave gifts made by dwarves, the same dwarves who fashioned Thor's hammer. Sometimes accompanying Odin was the alpine goddess Berchta, whose name derives from Berchentag, which means Feast of the Epiphany. Like the pre-Christian witch Lucy, Berchta roamed the earth on the Twelve Nights of Yule. It was very important that every female child tended to spinning their allotted amount of wool or flax that night. Those who had, and any child who had been good, would receive coins in their shoes. Those who failed, and those who had been bad, would be eviscerated, their organs replaced with straw. As Christianity took hold in Germanic lands, St. Nicholas and Odin merged. St. Nicholas, who was nearly always depicted as an older man with a white beard, was an intuitive stand-in for Odin. Not only did the two figures look similar, but Nicholas's feast day of December 6th conveniently fell within the Yule celebration season. It was reasonably easy for church officials to promote the bishop as a replacement to the pagan god, and the festivities during Yule as celebrations in honor of this saint. And so the formerly thin, beak-nosed bishop from Greece grew taller more robust and paler, more Scandinavian and godlike, both in appearance and behavior. His mitre and crossier disappeared, replaced by a warm, fur-lined hood or wreath of pine or holly on his head and a gnarled staff in his hand. This new pagan Nicholas took on the characteristics of local midwinter divinities, local guises of Odin and other midwinter gods. He became Father Christmas in England, who rides a horse, one with only four legs, to Odin's eight-legged sleep near. The donkey is one of the most popular steeds for the midwinter Nicholas. Scandinavian Nicholases often rode a goat, the Yule goat. In fact, the Norwegian gift-giving Nicholas figure is called Jalupuki, which means Christmas goat. The goat steed's origins can be traced to ancient festivals, welcoming the transit of the sun through the constellation Capricorn, the goat. The celestial phenomenon begins on the winter solstice and ends on Twelfth Night, or Epiphany. 
Nicholas figures riding a goat look an awful lot like the ancient god of plenty and debauchery, Bacchus. Just as Odin and Nicholas merged, so did the various ancestral spirits, minor gods, and mythical creatures that accompanied Odin on the wild hunt combine with Christian figures. There are very generally two archetypal types. A figure or figures that carry light, sometimes in the form of Saint Lucy, sometimes as groups of boys called Star Boys or Yule Boys, and other times the Christ Kindle or Christ Child. The second archetype is a malevolent demon or devil who has numerous names across Central and Northern Europe but is perhaps best known by what the Bavarians call him, Krampus. Pre-Christian midwinter gift givers in Europe had a disciplinary purpose, to frighten children into behaving. Here's a paragraph from Tom A. German's brilliant book, Santa Claus Worldwide, a history of St. Nicholas and other holiday gift bringers. Prior to the arrival of Christianity, the Germanic gods Odin and Berta served as both gift givers and disciplinarians during the pagan Yule. Catholic missionaries were compelled by the strategy dictated by Pope Gregory in the year 601 to have St. Nicholas, or an equally holy figure, take over the gift-giving role of Odin or Berta. The fact that Nicholas was a Catholic saint who was supposed to serve as an example of pious behavior meant beating children was outside of his job description. Therefore, the good cop, St. Nicholas, needed a bad cop to fill the disciplinary role. The bad cop vacancy was readily filled by the demon archetype that developed from the Wild Hunt hunting party. They appeared either as a creepy, dirty man or as an anthropomorphic, demonic creature. Many of them carried a bag in which naughty children would be imprisoned, sometimes taken away forever. They were also armed wielding pitchforks, birch rods, or bundles of switches, weapons to further punish naughty children. As this bad cop figure evolved, he was sometimes named as the devil himself. And just as often, the dirty human would devolve into a racist portrayal of a Turk, Jew, or African. A survey of bad cop figures across Europe is a tour of the cultures that were feared and discriminated against by Christians. The Bavarian Krampus is the most famous of the bad cop demons. He's the textbook image of a Christian creature from hell, goat-like with horns, cloven feet, and a monstrous face with a forked tongue protruding from a mouthful of teeth. The sometimes slightly problematic human bad cop is an unshaven, filthy man dressed in soiled rags or animal skins. He's known as Black Pete in the Netherlands and Low Countries, Schmutzel, which means dirt in Switzerland, Belschnickel in southwestern Germany, Necht Rupert in eastern Germany and Bavaria, Père Fouettar, which means Father Whipper in northern and eastern regions of France, and many, many others. Saint Nicholas no longer traveled alone. His arrival at a household was always in the company of an enforcer who'd punish bad children either the demon bad cop or the human bad cop. Interestingly, as Tom German points out, it's only the St. Nicholas figures who retained their Episcopal and Christian attire that were accompanied by an enforcer. The gift givers without religious trappings like Father Christmas traveled the winter season alone and dealt out both gifts and punishments. Soon, some of the human bad cops like Belschnickel also replaced St. Nicholas to visit households on their own. Tom German calls these non-Christian figures faux Nicholases or fake Nicholases. He links the appearance of faux Nicholases and their replacement of St. Nicholas with the Reformation. Here is another passage from his book to explain further. 
The disappearance of St. Nicholas in Protestant regions following the Reformation led to a new regime of gift givers who could perform both the gift giving function and the disciplinary function of evil helpers, and a gradual shift from St. Nicholas's Day to Christmas as the highlight of the Christmas season. The post Reformation gift givers, who operate under more than two dozen names in Germany and Central Europe, typically look like distinctly unjolly versions of St. Nicholas unshaven and ungroomed men wearing dirty brown cloaks or animal skins and carrying bundles of switches. As secular figures, they assume both the gift giving and disciplinary roles of St. Nicholas and his evil helpers. In the 15th century, the Protestant Reformation swept through Christendom. One of the many Catholic practices abhorred by these Christian reformers was the worship of saints, which was likened to the idolatry and polytheism of pagans. So St. Nicholas disappeared from these regions, replaced by Odin-like figures and sometimes the human bad cop. In so doing, the ancient gift-giving tradition was able to continue as a purely secular observance, moved from the saint's feast day on December 6th, which was now illegal, to Christmas Day or Christmas Eve. It might seem ironic that the traditions and observances for a saint's feast day would be prohibited, then moved to Christmas. But in the 15th century, the 25th of December wasn't an important Christian holiday. Christmas celebrations were criticized by many, both inside and outside the Catholic Church. Easter was the main focus of the liturgical year. Creating a secular gift-giving day on Christmas might have been a way to repress religious Christmas celebrations whilst ridding the calendar of days honoring saints in Protestant-controlled areas. There's another pre-Reformation custom that might explain why the faux Nicholases started giving gifts on Christmas. The centuries-old tradition of the Christ Kindle, a child representative of Christ who arrives on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve with gifts. The child is usually a blonde girl, accompanied by Krampus or the human bad cop Hans Trapp. She's often quite androgynous, other times depicted as the Christ child. And in the 19th and early 20th centuries, she becomes an angel with a single star, the Star of Bethlehem, glittering like a floating diadem above her head. Perhaps when St. Nicholas was erased from the 6th of December, the faux Nicholases, Krampus, and their numerous brethren joined the Christ Kindle on her day of presence, Christmas. In Catholic regions, St. Nicholas and his enforcer companion also began appearing with the Christ Kindle. Many Catholic illustrations from the 17th century onwards show a threesome entering a household on Christmas Eve. St. Nicholas, an enforcer like Krampus, and the Christ Kindle. Then, sometime in the 18th century, the Christ Kindle began disappearing, leaving only St. Nicholas and the demon. The Christ Kindle also morphed into other gift-giving figures, particularly in Scandinavia. St. Lucy combines with the Christ Kindle in many 18th and 19th century illustrations. The two female figures dressed in white are almost indistinguishable. The tell is in the placement of candles. Generally speaking, St. Lucy wears an evergreen wreath of candles on her head, whilst the Christ Kindle holds a candle in her hands. And then there are the star boys from across Europe. These are groups of boys, and today girls as well, who dress up in robes, reminiscent of the Three Kings. They wear conical wizard hats, decorated with stars like the hat Mickey Mouse has in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. They sing Christmas carols and feature in nativity plays. It's a tradition that began in 1417, which saw the appearance of star boys in illustrations depicting gift givers, especially those that arrive on Epiphany Eve. The mingling and mixing of midwinter gift giving figures isn't linear at all. Multiple combinations coexisted across several gift giving weeks in a holiday season stretching from early December through mid-January. Christian demons mingled with pagan yule cats, yule goats, and ancient witches who stalked the darkness of winter. 
leaders of the wild hunt changed places with Christian saints and nature gods. To visit households whilst riding a variety of hooved steeds, magical and otherwise. Two distinct gift giving figures emerged from the 16th century and continued in parallel to the present. Firstly, Saint Nicholas, a Christian bishop accompanied by an evil helper and or a Christ kindle like youth. And secondly, a secular gift giver, the human bad cop, either filthy and dressed in rags or godlike, resembling Odin, or Gandalf the Grey. It was in the colonies of America where the multinational cast of midwinter celebrations met, mingled, and mixed in an unprecedented fashion as immigrants brought a diversity of traditions across the Atlantic into multi-ethnic enclaves. Stay tuned for part two of Last Christmas, as we accompany nearly every midwinter demon, gift-giver, and god to step foot on North American soil for the first time and meet an entire continent of Native American midwinter figures, and to discover how a harvest holiday that was a celebration of thanks changed the minds of the pilgrims who prohibited the celebration of Christmas. Had the pilgrims had their way, Santa Claus would never have existed. Thank you so much for listening to part one of this special episode, Last Christmas, St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, and Christmas Past. Special thanks to my friends Judy and Domino Dye from Houston, Texas. Domino is also my cousin. They've both been St. Podcast fans since the very beginning. Thank you so much, Judy and Dom, for all of your support. For images of the artworks, people, and topics mentioned in this episode, please have a look at the St. Podcast website at www.saintpodcast.com. The word saint is spelled out, S-A-I-N-T. The Christmas sleigh bell sound effects were downloaded from Pixabay. The medieval music was composed by Kay McLeod, also downloaded from Pixabay. Thanks again for listening, and stay tuned for part two. Happy holidays and Merry Christmas. Thank you.